Hello everybody and welcome to the SEMrush webinar. Today we're going to be learning about Chrome development tools for SEO um, and we've got some fantastic guests joining us today. Uh, first we have Steve Bailey. Steve, um, he is the um, SEO at Spike Digital and he's prepared a great presentation for us today so we're really looking forward to going through that. But Steve, you also used to be a primary teacher I hear. <laughs> Unmute. Unmute. There you go. <laughs> first, first technical issue of the day. Um, yes, I used to teach um, seven and eight year olds in a primary school in Leicester. Um, did it for a couple of years, and and that was more than enough for me. Um, thankfully, got out <laughs> of that profession. And I hear you had quite a famous uh, student who uh, you yes. showed how to play football you taught him how to play football is that right no, not not in the slightest yes uh, <laughs> shay adams who's a premier league footballer now saw him on telly thought is that my shay uh, and indeed it was but yeah he was a brilliant footballer even from the age of of seven but i'm woeful at any kind of physical education so we didn't get <laughs> any of that from me um and i'm sure we're all probably thankful that i'm, I'm no longer teaching <laughs> well, you've definitely made a great career for yourself in SEO, <laughs> um, and I've, I've already seen the slides, I've had a little sneak peek, um, and I'm really, really excited for you to share them with everybody. Um, and after your presentation, uh, we're going to go to the panel, and if anybody has any questions in, in the presentation or throughout, uh, then please pop them into the chat, that would be great. Um, but we're also joined with Ruben. Ruben is from Vision Interna in Ill Interactive. Is that Vision or Vision? Sorry, you're on mute. Vision Interactive. Yep. Vision. Yeah. Um, but you've also got a pretty impressive uh, CV. Worked both client side and agency. Um, where we've, you've, you're from the UK originally, but now you're all the way over in America. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. So I, I uh, went to Staffordshire University, graduated and then went down to London to work for an ISP. Uh, so that's where I got some of my technical chops. And then um, I came to the US in 2000 to co-found a travel company. And once I built the website, now you have to figure out how do you get traffic to it. And back then in the dot-com days, uh, being a startup, we couldn't buy banner advertising uh, all day and night. So I, I remember I got recommended um Aaron Wall's SEO book. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Remember that right from back in the yeah. day. Uh, so I bought that and uh that's kind of how I got into SEO is just through a need of um you know having to to build traffic. Yeah. And so since then I've been doing I sort of specialized in SEO and have worked uh, across a number of different companies uh, over the past 20 years now. That's amazing. <laughs> I think I was a bit the same. I used to build flash websites and then I wondered why they weren't at the top of the search engine. So uh, that was a big education for myself. Um, also, we have Jerry. And Jerry, you've worked with some amazing brands over the year, uh, but now you're with Rise at Seven as the uh, SEO director. Yep, that's right. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yep. Um, but also, um, you know, you've worked with some amazing brands. You've been in the business for 20 years. Can you tell us any more? <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. So I've, I've done everybody from the government right through to, I'm trying to give some good examples. I was actually working for Weight Watchers and McDonald's and Gordon Ramsay all at the same, same, at time. The same time. So I think <laughs> that you can, I think you can sort of say that, you know, I've kind of tackled every kind of angle. Um, went on to government, uh, BBC, some really huge brands like Odeon. In fact, Odeon's one of the Rise at Seven clients, uh, I'm trying to think of us that we've been kind of working with recently, but uh, yeah, misguided e-commerce clients, everything, everywhere. I've had quite a fun career, I think, over the years. Yeah, I think that's I one of the sure. great things about SEO, isn't it? You can work with so many different clients in so many different industries, and uh, it's a really, it's really great experience, I think. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I was a lecturer for a while, but I, I was pretty terrible at it, just over the border <laughs> from uh, Leicestershire as well, actually in Derbyshire. So done a few bits. Fantastic. Um, so where's everyone from? Um, and having a look in the chat, everybody. Oh, we've got someone from India. Hello, someone from Chicago. That's brilliant. Paula Montano, you're from Long Beach. 
So we've got loads of people all watching. No pressure, Steve. Um, shall we get started? Steve, would you like to uh, go through your presentation for us? Yeah, absolutely. And um, welcome to those from Chicago, uh, home to my bears. Um, <laughs> so uh, good, good to see you on board. Um, let's just set this up. Okay, oh, can everybody Andrew see that? As well. Yep, we can see that. That's, that looks great. Excellent. <clears throat> so, yeah, today I'm just going to run through Chrome Developer Tools and how we use them at Spike, um, you know, why we use Chrome Developer Tools at Spike, really, to better inform our auditing, uh, our communication with clients and with the developers who are going to, you know, take on board our recommendations and trying to try to implement them. Um, if you have never well my uh, clicker is not working so that's another good start let's just use the laptop instead hello can anybody hear me hello can you hear can you yeah, hear me we, sorry we can for some you. reason yeah. Uh, for some reason, all of that prep that we did beforehand did not work. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to uh, go back into PowerPoint, get get this working again, hopefully. Sorry about this, guys. Yeah, brilliant. Don't worry, that's what always happens. <laughs> Uh, you can trust anything but technology. Apparently so. I usually find at that moment it wants to do a big update just at the wrong moment. Yeah. It's uh... okay. Well, I think is that is that working? Are we on? It is. That looks good yeah, to me. That Perfect. Looks great. Excellent. Okay. So um, sorry about that, everybody. And back into the presentation. So yeah, if you've never used Chrome DevTools before, um, it's really one click away if you use the Chrome browser. All you need to do is right click on the page and click inspect option, which is at the bottom. Um, and that's going to open up like a, a whole new world for you if you've never seen it before. And it can seem very overwhelming as well. Um, there's an awful lot of information that's packed into here. There's so many options. Um, and I, I, you know, I use Chrome DevTools a lot, but there's a, many of these options. But I don't really know what their function is, how to make most use out of them. Um, but when we're looking at it for SEO, I think there are some things within Chrome DevTools which are really, really useful for us. Um, so yeah, if it's your first time, don't get overwhelmed by everything that appears on the screen. Um, so if Chrome Dev Developer Tools is so kind of overwhelming for so much in in it why did why would you use that over some of the other tools that we have available because we've got many and they're excellent we've got webpagetest.org yellow lab tools which is one of my favorites the lighthouse report and page speed insights and all of these for seo they give us kind of grades and details about those grades um, they give us performance scores and the metrics around them. Um, and they even give us some really good opportunities. You know, they list out problems with the website. And all of this is, you know, free and it's at your fingertips. You can just, you know, run a report and it gives you all this information. So why jump in to something that is a bit more complex when it comes to Chrome DevTools? Um, and probably the best answer that I can give to that is right now everybody is probably looking at core web vitals. Um, Google will be rolling out later this month, I believe, unless we change the date again. Um, and you can, you know, this is an example of one website where we fixed cumulative layout shift. We got that score down to zero in both Lighthouse and webpagetest.org. And that was fantastic. But then when we looked at real world field data, so user data, um, we actually had a failing score 
0 0.32. And all of these tools that we've been using before simply weren't picking out the layout shift that actually users were experiencing. And that's one of the ways where Chrome DevTools just gives you that bit more insight. You can delve further into your site and get more information out. So I'm going to start with that first problem that we had, which was emulating user experience, um, in particular for trying to analyze layout shift. Um, so here's a, a mock-up that I did of a, of a client website. Um, and this is you know, the home page as it loads in. And if you don't interact with that page, there's barely any layout shift whatsoever on it. Um, but if a user scrolls down slightly, then you end up with this nav, this sticky nav that pops in at the top that I've colored blue there. Um, and that actually causes quite a significant amount of layout shift. And none of the other tools are going to pick that up because they don't interact with the page. Um, so within Chrome DevTools, how can we, you know, how can we record that? How can we show it and identify what the issues are? So there's something called the performance report within DevTools. If you've never used it before, it's fantastic. It, you, um, you can refresh the page and load it in, and it will record everything that that page does, um, every resource that it uses, and, and so forth. So if we do it for this, um, this mock-up that I've done, and if I don't interact with the page at all, this is the kind of information that it gives you. It gives you all of these slides frame by frame of how that page is being built up. And then this experience bar at the bottom shows us two different points of layout shift. These little kind of orange boxes identify layout shift. Um, and the score for that layout shift is very, very small, as I've said. So what I want to do, because this is just sort of showing us what Lighthouse, for example, might record, is actually interact with the page whilst I'm recording it. So again, we go back to performance report, we click refresh and reload and record. And if whilst it's doing all of that, I scroll down the page and scroll back up again, then you can see in this kind of frame by frame picture, we'll see that, that blue sticky nav that appears at the top. Um, and it's recorded all of my interactions with the page. And now I have four points of layout shift. And this is what that field data was recording. This is um, what was giving us the failing score at the time. So um, I'll just put the, uh, the two side by side so that you can see the difference. Uh, the top one where we've just got a snapshot, the bottom one where we're interacting. And now I can go and dig into these extra two elements of layout shift, and we can actually have a much truer view of the score. So this top one has a cumulative score of 0 0.02, and that's a pass. So if you're judging your website by just taking a snapshot, you will get a pass grade for this. But the bottom one, where well, we have the four points of layout shift. Well, that gives us a much bigger score of 0 0.48, which is a fail. So being able to do this using the performance record, uh, report, clicking record, and simply interacting with the page as you do um, will give you insights into what the, the users are actually experiencing. And to my knowledge, you know, this is kind of the best place that I've ever come to try and identify that. Um, I've been guessing for so long trying to fix cumulative layout shift. And I've found this to just be really, really good at identifying those gaps where the other tools fall a bit short. Um, so suggest that you, you go off and try that if you've got to that point where field data is actually showing that you're failing, but all the tools are saying that you've fixed that issue. Um, problem number two. I like to move on to. And this is kind of the same in showing a client and showing a developer what the impact of certain problems are. Um, you know, in a Lighthouse report, it will give you those opportunities. It will say, remove unused JavaScript and such. Um, but it doesn't dig any further into it that, than that. It doesn't actually show a client what it might look like if you do remove those scripts. So I've been using Chrome DevTools to show my clients the difference in scores 
that they might get if they were to remove them. And that's without any access to the back end and actually removing those scripts or involving a developer that might be expensive. And you can do this using DevTools. Um, and we'll start off in this example, running the Lighthouse report within Chrome DevTools itself. So not only have you got Chrome DevTools, you've also got Lighthouse built into it as well. And we run a Lighthouse report through Chrome DevTools on this particular website, it's a jeweler's site, and it gives us a score of 41, um, which is quite poor. And one of the recommendations that it gives us to us is to remove unused JavaScript. Okay, that's great. And I can say that to the client. Uh, I can highlight this one, and I know that the, the text on these slides is, is a bit small at times, um, but this, is a script that uses the, this message button down at the bottom. Um, so it's kind of a chat messaging script, and it's very heavy. Uh, and it comes from zopin.com. And I could say to the client, if you remove that, your performance score may go up. And their natural reaction will be, well, we, we, we like our message button and the functionality that gives to our users. Um, and we're not actually sure how much of a difference it would make to the performance of our site. So what I really want to do is go to that client and say, okay, I've measured it, and this is the kind of difference that you will see. And we can do that by simply blocking this script from running and rerunning the Lighthouse report. And we do that from an area called the network request blocking, which on my screen is all the way down at the bottom. It may be different in your setup of DevTools. And it's really simple to do. So we know that the script that I was looking at there comes from zopim.com. Uh, we go to network request blocking, um, enable it, click the little add, um, symbol, and you get the ability to just write some text in here. And what you're looking for is to write in zopim. Um, you can use the wildcard either side, so it will collect any subdomains and, and so forth. Uh, you can do this with any domain that your website is, is pulling content from. And we can block that content from being called. So the next time that I run a Lighthouse report, it's going to block those requests and only judge the page on what has been allowed to be requested. So if we go back to the original performance report, so this is with Zopim, we have a score of 41. And when I run that Lighthouse report again and block it, then we get a score of 52. Now, that is much more persuasive for me to go to a client with. You'll also see that the metrics below those total performance scores, they're pretty much all better without this message button appearing and the script that's related to it. Um, it may not be enough of an argument for them to remove it, but it certainly highlights the argument to maybe find a lighter script or a different way to implement the script. Because going from 41 to 52 in a score that's out of 100 is very, very significant. So I found this really useful without any, you know, without getting any dev involved or permissions to change things within Tag Manager and so on, I can just run this on my own device and get a better score out and then show the client what it might mean to them. Moving on to my third problem, and this is probably my favorite part of Chrome DevTools, is the ability to test your recommendations. So at Spike, what I like to do when I'm doing an audit is provide recommendations that I know will work. And the only way that I really know that they will work is if I can test them. So again, with a website that you have no access to, um, you can't just go on and change things. What you can do is use Chrome DevTools and actually take control of a website locally, essentially. Um, so I can take control of, say, a CSS file or a JavaScript file. I can make changes to that and carry on running performance checks, and it will use my changes. And it's, it's fantastic. I, I absolutely love it. Um, so here's an example taken from Boots, the chemist. Um, and this is a page that's loading in. It's, uh, it's one of our article pages. Um, and as it loads in, they get some layout shift. We're using layout shift again because it's it's visual for a webinar. Um, so 
this is the final um, version of the page. And as you can see, the information here gets pushed all the way down below this image that loads in. Now I know, or I think I know, that I've got a bit of code that I could put into their CSS file that would fix all of this, um, this piece of code here. So I need to, I want to be able to test this. I need to take control of their CSS file, put my code into there, and then reload the page and force it to use my version of the CSS file. And we do this by using something called save overrides. Um, to begin with, we need to start off within sources, and we're looking at the page tab on that. And that will give you a list of every single file that is being called by this page, this page on the Boots website. And I'm looking for this CSS file here because I want to be able to edit it. And all I'm going to do on that, um, that particular file is right click on it and then click Save for Overrides. And that means that I've now got a copy that the rest of this site will use, um, but I can make changes too. So then we move over two tabs into Overrides. I find, again, the, the, the saved file that I've just made. And then I can add my fix into that and save that version. And now, when I refresh the page that I'm looking at, it's going to use my fixes. So here, we've got the example from before, where you have this massive amount of layout shift that occurs. And this is my version, where as the page loads in, that space for the image is retained. So all of the content is where it will end up. There's no layout shift. And finally, the image loads in. So that's a fix that I can confidently go to Boots with and say, I know this works. I've tested it. It means that I don't just go to their developers and say, can you work out how to fix this? Or here's some options that might work, because that's going to cost them more money. So the better my recommendation, and the more confident that I am in that recommendation, then the better for our clients, the better service that we give to our clients, I think, in, in that respect, the more value that they get out of us, and the less that we back up their dev time with our fixes, making it more likely that they'll actually implement some of the fixes that we give to them. So save overrides, you can take control of absolutely any element of a page, make changes to it, and test your theories out with that. Um, and finally, and this is, this is just one that was bugging me for a while, it's visualizing font flicker issues, which are becoming more and more of an issue when it comes to user experience and the core web vitals. And it's really difficult to see them because it's a flicker. It happens so quickly. And my problem was just kind of visualizing this to a client so that they understood what the problem was. And I looked for various tools and opportunities to do this, and none of them really fitted the bill. So this is just a way, really, to get a screenshot to show them what it looks like with this font flicker. Um, and so here's an example taken from Ted Baker. We've got the primary font on the left. This is what most people are going to see when it's fully loaded. And on the right, we have the fallback font. So this is the font that will load before that, that the website's loaded, the primary font. So fallback fonts tend to be ones that are already locally stored on somebody's system, you know, common Windows fonts. And you can see here that the two are very different in size. You can look at that top navigation where it's much more clustered up on the right-hand side and the text Below it is, you know, it's kind of all out of sorts. So what Ted Baker really should be doing here is finding a fallback font that is much closer in size and shape than this particular one. Um, and so this, this is just an example of how you can get screenshots like this. And what we're looking at is the elements section within DevTools. Um, and again, it's really small on, <coughs> excuse me, on the screen. But these kind of double A icons um, are kind of font controllers within the style section. And all you need to do is click on one of those and it opens up this font selector. And then at the top here with font family, simply 
change the font family from the primary font to the fallback font. And then that will update everything on your screen to show you what people might see as the page loads. Um, and it just saved me so much time when trying to explain to a client what the problem was that I thought I'd include it in this. Um, so that's kind of just a run through of some of the things that I work with um, when it comes to Chrome Developer Tools. Some of the ways that I found it a lot easier, I guess, to explain to a client what the problem is or give them better recommendations um, to move forwards with. So thank you very much for listening. Um, sorry about the technical problems at the beginning. Thank you so much, Steve. That was really good. Um, I think that's one of the most uh, common problems we have is getting developers to, to do work for us. Uh, you, you say you implement the changes, so it's a really good way of actually being able to show that and demonstrate that to developers uh, to get rid of any objections, I suppose. And like you say, they're more likely to put it in and also getting that client buy-in. That's uh, really good, some really useful tips there. Thank you. So we've had a few questions already. Uh, anybody who does have any more questions, please uh, pop them into the chat. Uh, the first one is from Alexis Pretty. How is the best way to trace what is calling a given script? Uh, so she uses Shopify and she says it's a needle in a haystack trying to determine which app is calling a given uh, JavaScript or CSS query. Is there anybody want to answer that? <laughs> Who's anyone any recommendations? Ooh, um, just from my point of view, absolutely. The amount of times where you find that a script's calling a script, calling a CSS file, and you're trying to figure out where it is coming back again. Um, in the network tab, you can actually see what is actually initiating something. Um, one of the things that surprised me, and I didn't realize about the network tab, is that the Along the top, all the different um, columns, there's actually a load of hidden ones. And if you right click on one of them, you can add extra ones into it. So make sure all the right ones are enabled. Um, and yeah, as Steve basically says, you can kind of like uh, disable them in the network tab as well, not just the, where, where were you disabling them in the overrides tab? But basically, I was I didn't realize about that because I've always been doing it in the network one where you could just right click on one and kind of disable it there. And it, but as you say, basically, it's surprising how nested everything is. And it is, as you say, a needle in a haystack. I don't know if there's a simple answer to it other than the fact that you just start blocking stuff and seeing what is blocking, what's still working, and just carrying on like that. It isn't an easy task, but actually I've achieved a lot by just kind of like doing that, basically fiddling with stuff and sort of seeing what works. Mm. It's great to have a safe environment to do that, isn't it? Yep, absolutely. Steve, I don't know if you've got a better suggestion. Um, no, not really. But it's it is, um, and I I imagine that there is one in Chrome DevTools, and that you know it's one of those things that I've I've never possibly really struggled with with that. Um, it's like things like save overrides. I only came across that because I was determined that I needed to try and test it to to get it past the post. Um, so there's possibly you know a blog out there that will will kind of go through it much better but you can uh, if you know the script that you're looking for you can um, when you select a file it will give you the, the whole readout of that JavaScript for example so you can search so a quick way of looking would be you know if you know precisely what's being called you could use that string put it in a search and if it doesn't find any matches you know that it's not within that file so you can then go to a different file I think there's possibly a way that would would do that much, much, much quicker. But that's probably what I would default to right now is, is, you know, if it was that hidden away, just try and find out where it's mentioned using that process. The one thing I have found useful is slowing it down. So there's, uh, there's the two things within the performance tab that you showed, which is like the network, slow it down and put it on a slow 3G. So you can actually see it building up along almost. And when you've got the network kind of tab coming up, that's another way in which I kind of use it. So basically combining those bits and pieces. I use the network tab a lot more than I use the performance tab in Parnas. So it's interesting that you use the performance tab for more. Yeah, I mean, I use I use both. Um, the The performance has really helped me with Core Web Vitals. I think the network is, is really good for digging into how things are, are being loaded up. Um, there might be something to do with breakpoints that you could use. Um, but that is something that I looked at, got a bit confused over, 
and walked away from. Um, so, but that might be another area that, that you could do for when something actually hits. Um, like Jerry was saying, that you know, it's kind of like breaking it down. It could pause and stop at that point that it's loaded. You may be able to detect better um, what's actually calling it. Simon Cox in the chat's just given a good idea, actually. He's basically said about using kind of a blank page. Um, and that's just something actually we've been doing with a number of kind of a client sites almost, particularly for uh, Shopify, actually, is trying to, or, or WordPress is trying to find the most blank possible page to kind of go, right, this is the benchmark of the blank page. And then before we add in the product feeds and the Google Tag Manager and everything else like that, just to kind of do exactly that. So yeah, good suggestion from Simon there. Yeah, that is a great tip. Yeah, um, Stephanie Alvarez has asked about Lighthouse and why does it give a different report? Um, shouldn't they be quite similar? Anyway. So the biggest problem with Lighthouse is the fact that it's run locally. Well, it's not. It's actually one of the best things about Lighthouse is it's run locally. So it's run off your computer. And like right now, for some reason, my computer is whirring away. It's probably because I've got webcam plugged in and all sorts of other bits and pieces going on and all like that. As soon as I load up Screaming Frog, it's slowing down even further. Um, and that basically will impact the Lighthouse score. Um, what I tend to do to just sort of kind of a consistent Lighthouse score is use web.dev slash measure. And that's basically because that's kind of relatively clean browser. Uh, the downside to that, of course, is it's happening from a location that isn't maybe local. So we might want something to kind of almost try it locally as well. Um, so yeah, basically, because it's on your computer and because you've got other things running and because you know different times of the day, different server responses, you will get different numbers. Hopefully, they'll be fairly consistent as long as you kind of do it in the same way. But again, even servers will sometimes need to speed up. Caching will be impacted. If you're loading a page once and then you load it 10 minutes later, the server, the CDN, all sorts of bits and pieces might have cached it as well. So there's a lot of reasons why, even if you don't change anything, you'll get a different score. Um, one of the other kind of comments in there was about using incognito mode, because one of the things that I was surprised me was when I was running Lighthouse, it was also using the, the, the extensions that I've got running. And I've got, uh, I'm trying to count them now, about 20 different extensions kind of running at, at the moment. And of course, it's using the scripts and bits and pieces from all those bits and pieces, which is impacting the score. So from computer to computer, from server to server, to time of the day, everything will impact your Lighthouse score. So there isn't, so it does kind of feel like sometimes you'll kind of get a major jump and you think, wow, I've cracked it. And it will turn out that, you know, if you run it again two minutes later and it hasn't cracked it. So yeah, that's a great question, actually. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really good tip about turning off the extensions because um, some of them will make all these additional requests and try to overlay things onto the screen, and that all sort of impacts time. So I think definitely you want to disable all of the extensions when you're doing this, uh, specifically on a client site, and then never believe the first scores that come across um, <laughs> because you just never know. So typically when I'm running this, I'm going to run it like two, three, four times, see what the average scores are like, and then just yeah. take one representative set and then run with that. Yeah, that's good. That's really good advice. Um, so we hear a lot um, about site speed, and obviously more recently we've been hearing a lot about Google Core Web Vitals. Do you think there's going to be big changes when that finally rolls out? I'm going to throw that at Steve. <laughs> Although Jerry's shaking his head. <laughs> I mean, Google, Google have come out and said, this is just, it is a ranking factor, but it's not the ranking factor. It's not a massive ranking factor. You know, it's it's still all about, you know, what is your product offering? What's the content that is on your page? So, you know, I kind of, part of me wants it to be bigger than it, than it's going to be because I'm you know putting a lot of work into it for, for clients and I like them to see, get see them get some value out of that um I think it it's it's going to be something that will you know maybe flip you a couple of positions you know if your if your content is the same as your competitors content but your core web vitals are better then you'll steal a bit of a march on them. But I don't see Core Web Vitals as being, you know, if you're BMW or something like that and your Core Web Vitals are terrible, you're still going to be, you know, well-placed in those search results. Yeah. You're not going to get choked out of that. So um, 
I think it's a really good move in the right direction, both for Google and for clients. I think it should be offering a better user experience. And I think one of the wins that clients will get out of it is an improvement in conversion rate. So they might get better rankings a little bit, and they might get more traffic through that. But if their user experience is better, and that's what Google are driving towards, then hopefully their conversion rate gets better. You know, people just like using that site more. So I'm I'm not expecting it to be a massive, you know, kind of wave of websites falling out of page one. Um, anything like that. That's my not take. Really bad. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's good. Um, I think relevance is always going to be more important than anything else. I think the one time that I think this is going to kind of change the gap a little bit is um, is when you've got like three or four websites all with the same exact e-commerce product. So, you know, you've got five products the same. They've all got similar H1, similar H title tag, similar backlink profile. And, you know, that's when you kind of have to go, right, you know, th this is going to maybe impact it that tiny bit, in, you know, and that's when it's going to be important. I think on the, on the flip side, one of the other major benefits of Core Web Vitals uh, and some of the changes, not necessarily in relation to search rankings directly, but now Google has equipped us with a set of actual metrics and baseline figures. Um, so it makes our lives as the SEO practitioners easy to get the client buy-in because now we can say, Look, Google says this is the number that you have to hit for to be considered good. Um, and we know that a lot of our recommendations don't get implemented uh, for whatever reason. Um, but definitely the, the Core Web Vital scores being quantifiable now um, allows us to actually put something in front of the client and say, look, Google says this is what the score needs to be to be considered good. Uh, and generally, clients tend to react to favorably to those kinds of recommendations and i think it will help get a lot more of our recommendations implemented and then make the experience better for everybody yeah i think you're right it's going to be more about conversion rate and engagement rate and and improving kind of their user experience you know we've all come across a website which is just so terrible where you kind of go this is just not good enough almost and i've actually witnessed somebody trying to buy from a website and as they were going through it the, the cumulative layouts uh, problem basically things shifting around they got so frustrated they were trying to buy about 150 pounds worth of cosmetics and what else was it and yeah basically the whole thing um and it just goes through the, the, the entire process it, actually most people will end up buying that particular journey but they won't come back again they'll prefer a competitor yeah i think it will help uh when you're having these conversations with clients because i, I know from myself some of the conversion rate optimization work we do um there's always things like well we need a chat box we need the register to sign up get your discount and this pop-up 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 and i find it frustrating and even when you're going through with a client they're finding it frustration but they still really really want it and um, it's being able to give them a little bit more information that will give them an, a more informed decision over whether they keep them or whether they drop them uh, and actually having the stats to back that up would be brilliant so um we've had another question from highway one marketing are there any studies that correlate Lighthouse score to any measure of rankings or organic traffic? I think this uh, goes a little bit about what you were saying before. It's 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 a, a factor that nudges you rather than it being a, a massive impact. So Martin Split from Google did recently say uh, a comment basically where he said that a number of sites have jumped up in rankings because of not just because of the new may june update but because of historical ones where google kind of said actually we do prefer faster sites so there's always been a bit of a ranking boost and if you do sort out your website going from really not very good at, i was going to swear that really not very good at all to actually pretty good now you will see you can see an improvement basically in your organic rank, uh, organic rankings traffic and other bits and pieces so there has been correlation, but most of the studies that I've seen have very much been focused on the user impact rather than the organic impact so far, unless your website's terrible. That said, when this rollout comes out, I'm really looking forward to kind of comparing um, visibility and SEMrush, is that how you pronounce it? Yes, SEMrush or uh, 
or, or whichever tool it is basically with with kind of a, a late lighthouse type score thing to sort of see if there's kind of an impact there are a few websites where i've sort of said you know this website's bad it'll probably drop to and I, I, this is what i'm kind of hoping to see almost but i don't think there's going to be much of a flux but it's a really good question i think there's something that will be interesting not so much as there a correlation now but will there be a a shift almost will that when this update hits Will we see slow ones drop and fast ones speed up? How much of a shift will that be? Mm. And also being able to actually attribute it to that rather than is it correlation or causation sort of thing. Um, so another question from Hansa Altaf. Mm. How, uh, any recommendations on reducing plugin load on uh, the WordPress to help with the website speed? I know I've got a lot of clients who've got so many plugins and uh, it does really drag their site has anybody got any recommendations so well i'm not on mute um <laughs> so maybe i should get to use I, I think you know it, it is a, a big problem and they can get very much out of hand um and this is i mean it's almost a case of you get what you pay for isn't it um if you have in-house dev you don't need to use these plugins and they can design it just for you, um, then, it's, then it's great. But if you're using WordPress and you think, well, I'll have this plugin for redirect, and this plugin for something else, and this plugin for chat, and you can't then go to them and, and get them to, to change, change that code. Um, I think, you know, a suite of plugins there are there are some out there for wordpress that do a lot so you, you at least know that they those plugins work together well um and some of them do have kind of request developer time and, and things like that so you can say oh could you do this and they might build it into a future version um but otherwise one thing that I would recommend if you've got lots and lots of plugins is just have a look. Do I need to run these on every single page? You know, do, do you need that pop-up, that interstitial coming in on every single page? No, you don't. So can you just narrow it down so it only appears on one where you're more likely to capture the information that you want? Do you need chat appearing on every single page? Dear God, no, you don't. <laughs> you know, it's like, please, you know, be a bit more restrictive about where yeah. you use these things. Can be, um, a, yeah, a way around it, or just you know, draw the line and say, well, we're not going to have any more. Um, that would be my 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 reaction. That's usually what I say. I'm always like, can we just develop you something? some functionality in there, but it's not always possible for everybody. It's not always possible yeah. for every budget. Uh, do you think these plugins and these chat boxes, bots um, are going to really affect a, a site search visibility when it all kicks in? One of the things I would say on that one is it depends how it's loaded. Um, you don't have to load everything when the page loads. You can load it into the page. I mean, we've been doing a lot of work using Google Tag Manager to basically say, page loads then you could load other stuff into it. Um, the worst thing I've seen is YouTube and Google Maps. I mean, Google seems to be the worst at slowing down everyone's websites, which is highly ironic. Um, but basically, yeah, Google Maps and YouTube and all these things are very heavy. So lazy loading, all those kind of things. And as Steve was kind of showing the thing, if you can demonstrate the page loads up without these scripts and everything like that loaded up in the yeah. first thing, then you can almost kind of go, okay, we're going to delay these things. We're going to defer them. We're going to make sure that they load up later rather than right at the start, which is kind of often the opportunity to really speed things up for the user. You know, these metrics are important, but the, but the usability of the site is more important. And as you've, we've sort of talked about first input delay, we want to get the site usable far faster, and then we can kind of load in the chat box and everything else like that, as long as it doesn't impact uh, CLS, which is the cumulative layout shift. So yeah, so many acronyms. <laughs> We're all about the acronyms, SEO. Um, uh, back, back to that WordPress plugin, uh, oh, just yes, one, one uh, question uh, that we had previously, one little tip that uh, I've had to deal with um, around this is in a staging environment, if the client has a ton of WordPress plugins, then try to consolidate them because quite often as the site ages over time, there's a new need for a new plugin. And so, you know, over the course of however many years, 
there's maybe you know 15 20 different plugins that are used and what you might find is well the the problem with this actually um and, and probably the origin of this question is every time you add a plugin to wordpress it adds its own javascript file and its own css file and so if you have 20 plugins you potentially have 20 custom javascript files and 20 custom css files and that all adds to uh, the resources needed to download and process to, to the payload and, and processing time so what you might find is take a take a look and see if there's uh, a new version of a plugin that can consolidate some of those functions into one yeah. and if if you're able to do that you can remove some of those javascript files um, and, and css files because they'll be common to that one plugin that can you know there's not one plugin that can do everything uh do do everything in one go but uh consolidating can be can be really really useful yeah and a lot of the plugins as they as they get better they bring in more functionality and you don't know where you've probably got quite a lot of crossover when you've mm. not actually audited your plugins for a while right that's a really good tip thanks um alexis pretty has asked if there is a public slack group or a reddit group um, where people are sharing the best practices for Core Web Vitals. Um, does anybody know of anything that's going on? Or maybe we're not invited, I don't know. <laughs> we're not. It does sound like it would be a good idea because there's, there's so much functionality that even like, I use them pretty much every day, but you know, I'm still learning. There's so much I don't know um, and so many new features that are coming out. That sounds like a good opportunity to start one. <laughs> Alexis, do you want to start that for us and we'll join? Okay, um, we've had another question from Ravi. Which WordPress themes have you found that have great performance? Now, for me, um, I hate themes. Um, I always feel like they're a one size fits all, which is never good for the individual website. So we usually go for sort of bespoke themes, which isn't really the answer that anybody's looking for, I don't think. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't usually like to install just a standard theme uh, on a client site. Typically, I'll, I'll look at the design of the theme and then we'll take it to a, a developer and then kind of make it custom uh, yeah. or we'll work on a, a custom theme, you know, from scratch. Um, because you know the same thing goes with the plugins. They we want to consolidate JavaScript and CSS files. We want to um, make it custom for the client. And quite often, there's um, a lot of these themes will use uh, frameworks for CSS. And in the resulting site, a lot of that is unused. Whether it's like form, uh, you know, form validation scripts and um, you know, HTML layout, font alternatives. Um, there's all kinds of different unused bits and pieces in these themes. And, uh, you know, by having a custom theme, we're able to strip all of that out. Which actually you can do in Chrome DevTools too. You can identify um, the unused CSS. So if you open the, the Chrome DevTools, go into Sources, and then go, uh, if you do control shift P and then type in coverage, uh, and then there's a little option that pops up called show coverage. It'll actually list all of your CSS and uh, JavaScript files, and it'll show you the percentage of usage of each one of those individual files. And then in the window above, you can actually see line by line all of the code and it'll uh, flag it, like mark those lines in red, which ones are unused. Uh, so that, that was a, a little tip there. That's a great tip. So uh, so somebody can find a theme that closest matches the, what they need and, and then go through that and try and remove as much yeah. of the unused JavaScript as they can to speed up the site essentially, or yep. make it just a much better site for users, search engines. And if, if that's too technical, because um, a lot of people just don't have that capability and that knowledge and skill, um, there are some other online tools as well. Uh, so there's unused CSS and unused JavaScript. So you can point your website at those tools. They'll basically download the 
page, the URL that it gives you, um, and then it will do that analysis for you. And it will then give you a CSS file that you can download, which is the, it's only going to contain the elements that are being used. That's good. Um, so Ernesto Augustin Lara, sorry if I pronounced that slightly wrong. Um, would you recommend using AMP strictly in WordPress for web vitals and speed? That's going away. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. And, I think what is the future vitals, of AMP? <laughs> yeah, would you no, like I to think that? Core Web Vitals is essentially, um, you know, Google's way of trying to persuade people to speed up their websites because I don't think the adoption of AMP was high enough. Um, so I would not just rely on AMP. Um, the other problem with AMP is because of its restrictive framework, uh, a lot of clients, they need those chatbots, they need those messaging tools, they need all of these third party scripts, which you can't have um, in AMP. So I would, I would not rely on AMP 100%. I think AMP as a framework is a great idea if you can develop your site completely in AMP and you can enhance it beyond the kind of the core AMP. So instead of using something like jQuery or using something like, um, you know, one of these other JavaScript frameworks, it's great. Um, but the whole, the CDN, the kind of cached version of it and things like that, the, the whole concept behind that, the problem with that from my point of view is the fact that we would get clients who would be developing two sets of code, trying to maintain it, that actually neglect one of them and, you know, after about six months, eight months, suddenly you discover that they weren't actually tracking it because they hadn't put the right, the new version of analytics on it or something similar. And we were trying to figure out why they were losing so much traffic to kind of websites that, sorry, web pages. And it was like, ah, oh, okay, you've actually not got your analytics code on that particular set of pages. So we're not tracking anywhere near as much organic traffic as we thought, traffic as we thought. So yeah, I'm very much a guy that will say to a client, do not implement AMP unless you're starting a brand new website and you want to kind of code it all up completely in AMP. And I think that's a great opportunity. But as you say, it's kind of something where you really have to know what you're doing. You really have to kind of know, this is the framework, this is the limitations, this is how I'm going to get around the limitations. And frankly, most developers I know, that's not their kind of go-to approach. Yeah, I think with with AMP, we've, we've got a couple of clients um, that we work with that are very much in the, the news you know, sporting news, things like that. Um, and so AMP pages, getting in those carousels uh, and the like at the top of the page is really important. Um, more so than, you know, if you're a B2B business and you're not really appearing in those kind of elements, it's maybe, maybe not worth, um, you know, the development time on that. So I think for, for the kind of the news outlets that have really benefited from AMP, they're going to have to carry on with that. Um, Google have made mention about AMP with Core Web Vitals um, and its its interaction, you know, they're still running AMP. Core Web Vitals might start, um, yeah, if, if they're very good, you might start appearing in similar places to where AMP pages are now. And I think the two will kind of come together, whether they'll ever kind of really get rid of AMP, because I really like the way that it is hosted, you know, that's, it can be really super quick. Um, so I don't think they're going to give up on that as a project, but I think we are now moving normal websites much more closer to um, what Google were hoping to achieve with, with AMP. And I think it's easier well, I say that I've been working on Core cool Web Vitals for websites for months now. Um, there was lots, <laughs> lots of problems um, to overcome, but I think it is easier than just saying, "Okay, well, recreate your website in, in AMP," which you know is 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 expensive uh, for people to do as well. What's the most common um, issue you've come across while you've been working on Core Web Vitals, Steve? Sorry, what what's the most common issues that you've been coming across on uh, websites? Um, I do, most of the time, unless it's a really bad website um, that, that just has so many issues that really Core Web Vitals isn't the problem, uh, most of the times the first input delay is absolutely fine for most of the websites I've seen, so that's all right. Um, I would say probably LCP, Largest Contentful Paint, um, which is an easier fix than 
the layout shift ones, which I think can get quite complex because they can happen in unexpected areas. Yeah. Um, whereas LCP is normally, okay, you've got a featured image that you haven't given, you know, it's on mobile, but you're loading in the desktop version. Um, you didn't bother optimizing it when you loaded it. You don't use anything like WebP. Um, so let's actually optimize that image, get it down from 500K to 44K. Let's preload it as well. There you go, it's done. Um, you, know, you know, and it's, so that, that one seems to affect just about everybody. Um, but it, there's some quite easy fixes for it as well. Yeah. Yeah, I think for me, the most common ones are the images, like you mentioned. And then what I was talking about earlier, the unused JavaScript and CSS. Um, and then HTTP2. That one, if you if you can get a site to use HTTP2, uh, which most sites I, I, I hope should be using by now, um, that one has a, a pretty big impact on, on performance. But I think those those three are typically the first things that I'm going to look at, um, and and then after that, the the uh, LCP is is pretty much going to be the next one because with that one, if you can change, you can make a change to the template. It's going to affect multiple pages on the site because most sites are driven by templates, um, not just WordPress sites, but you know um, multiple e-commerce and and whatever yeah. other sites that use a CMS, they're all going to be using a template. So you can adjust that um, that layout, then it affects, uh, it's the biggest bang for your buck. Has anybody got any top recommendations for people at home who are wanting to speed up their website? What would they, what would they do? Obviously you mentioned um, a few things there. <laughs> Image size, quickest, load size, any quick wins? Win. Cloudflare. I think if you can get your site onto Cloudflare, it's such an easy, quick win. Um, we've seen so much kind of impact from it. It's been phenomenally good. Um, it's just kind of a quick, you know, the downside to that is that everybody's talking about Shopify and Wix. And getting Shopify and Wix onto Cloudflare is nearly impossible. But beyond that, yeah, I would say Cloudflare. Um, <clears throat> if you were talking about code, actually making change to, to a website, then I would say preload and pre-connect because it doesn't take any dev time. It's a line of code. Pre preload your fonts, can sort out so many of your layout and shift issues just, just with one line. Um, dead easy to do. So one of the first things I go to. If people are planning on looking at Core Web Vitals for their own website, then first of all, I would say get into Google Search Console and look at what's been reported on. So yeah. just guess at the problem, go and actually find out and see, you know, cause you might be all right, um, uh, but it will actually tell you, you know, where those issues are from. That's my go-to place to, to figure out that in the first instance. Yeah, first stop, Search Console. Second stop, SEMrush, obviously. <laughs> Indeed. Um, is there any other questions? Let me just have a quick look in the comments and see who's... Uh, any more comments, any more questions? Uh, so Atrium Home just posted about how do you feel about page builders? Um, those can be, if I am interpreting that correctly, that's kind of like a, a, a WYSIWYG CMS, uh, perhaps. Uh, and those tend to be really loaded with extra JavaScript and CSS. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes it's very difficult to optimize those. Um, so you're limited to just things like the overall page template, how many, how much content you've got on that page and uploading the right size images. And if you can put a CDN in place, great. Um, but sometimes they can be problematic and that's the price you pay, right? So you either have something custom built or you have a nice easy interface uh, and you have to just unfortunately live with some of the bloat that comes along with that. Yeah. I think it's very difficult finding that balance, um, depending on you know your access to developers and your aspirations as well, because you know not every site is going to need to have perfect code. Some will do very well from using page builders, um, that sort of end. But being able to use Chrome Dev Tools to find little issues, or even just you know if you if you're hiring a developer to get them to do the issues, but you've already found 
the problem, uh, then that can save you a lot of money, a lot of time. Yeah, and if you're, if you're considering a page builder, try and find alternative sites that use the same page builder and then go to their About Us or their privacy policy, some sort of plain page, and then run Core Web Vitals on those pages and, and see what it looks like. That's a good tip. <laughs> Um, Hamza Altav has said, share basic key point of SEO in 2021. So um, I'm missing that's around what, what's the biggest thing in SEO that's going to come in 2021 or the most important thing to focus on. And I think Steve's probably going to say uh, Core Web Vitals. That, that, that's the one thing that we really know about. Um, yeah. What might be the core thing will be another one of their kind of August updates you know where we say hey we're google and we've we've just dropped this on multiple industries and it's thrown everything up and you know it was actually a, a expertise authority trust update or something like that um i think the one thing that we we know about core web vitals um so for me that's taking up a lot of my work but what they'll do three months down the line you know i, I dread to predict um what what that might be um so yeah i'll give that over to jerry or ruben to have a prediction at so far i've got every prediction wrong i've ever made normally i kind of do an event called take it offline where we do kind of an annual prediction thing and uh you know we try to kind of figure out what google's gonna prioritize i mean google's going far more down topicality and and um, you know sentiment and everything else like that and, my phone has just come alive because it heard me say the keyword. Um, <laughs> but basically, yeah, I think basically making sure that your entities and your relationships and all that kind of thing is, is getting good. Um, schema markup is definitely something that you need to investigate and do it right. It's it's not, it doesn't have to be very complicated. Just get the basics on there. And I think that's something that can help more than anything else right now. So apart from speed and then the schema, I think is hugely important. I definitely agree with you, Jerry, that that's uh, been a, a big focus of mine on so many sites uh, recently. Um, but if you think about the past few updates that Google's made, some of the big ones, they've all, all been around trust. So like the reviews update, uh, things like that. So I think, you know, people that are trying to um, game the system, uh, you know, with, with uh, you know, various forms of, different uh, strange reviews or, or, or you know, um, we have to produce good quality content and we have to make sure that those reviews uh, are providing the right trust signals. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, there's kind of multiple sort of updates that uh, algorithm updates that Google puts out. Some are geared towards like the things that they can measure and, and quantify and call web vitals, but the softer things, um, uh, around schema and then also the, uh, the the reviews, the trust signals. I think that's yeah. something that we really need to pay attention to. I mean, I, I do a lot of YouTube SEO and one of the things I, I try to anticipate what Google's going to bring out based on what they're already testing in YouTube as well. Um, and a lot of that is based on the very powerful recommendation engine yeah. um, all to do with, you know, personalized search, uh, trust, um sentiment or that sort of thing and your past history of everything that you've ever done ever on the internet ever um so all all that all that is where i see it going there's going to be more uh, emphasis on things like schema markup and getting you to click on that website and building that trust and it being authentic rather than you know reviews bought on fiverr kind of thing yeah i mean google's they just posted uh, just a few weeks ago about how much spam that they've combated, right? And they're now using AI to identify how many billions of pages of spam. So, the, you know, trust AI is, is fantastic. It's amazing yeah. what yeah. they can do. Except Jerry? when it comes to their paid stuff, their PPC <laughs> is riddled with, oh my God, I'm sorry, but but no, they, they seem to have organic results were actually very trustworthy mainly. But right above it is spam after spam after spam. You, 
sorry, I'm going on a bit of a rant because I worked in places like the government and stuff like that. And the amount of times where, you know, you'd get scraper sites, you'd get uh, fishing sites and everything, literally paying to be above the main site on brand. And it looks like it's on brand. Anyway, I'm going on a bit of a rant. I think we're kind of running out of time. And I could rant for about an hour on this particular we are We are running out of time, actually. But yeah, <laughs> when they're getting money for it, they're, uh, they're definitely a little bit lean, more lenient on what they let through, aren't they? <laughs> Anyway, we, as as you said, we are running out of time. Um, I think we're just a little bit over. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jerry, Ruben, and of course, Steve, for a fantastic presentation. Um, the, this is going to be on the uh, webinar, uh, the webinar YouTube channel, so people can watch this back and your presentation should be available there. Uh, and thank you very much. I think that's a wrap. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers.